all of a sudden questioning the uh, the environmental story behind Impossible or the ingredients behind Impossible because we were making it available at fast food. Um, that is, you know, classism and racism and all wrapped up into kind of our our biases around, you know, around food. Welcome to another episode of Breakthrough Dialogues, the podcast for pragmatists and problem solvers brought to you by the Breakthrough Institute. I'm Alex Trembath, your host and deputy director at Breakthrough. For this episode, I sat down with Jessica Applegren. Jessica is the vice president of communications at Impossible Foods. Impossible is one of the several companies working on clean meat or fake meat or protein alternatives, this new category of product that is aiming to replace animal agriculture. That is, in fact, the mission of Impossible Foods to replace all animal agriculture by 2035. And we talk a little bit about that mission and that deadline in this conversation. I wanted to talk to Jessica, who I've known for a couple years because Plant-based meat and and fake meat are, as we get into in the episode, a very sort of breakthroughian solution to environmental problems. We're talking about satisfying consumer demand for meat and protein just with a radically lower environmental impact, Um, basically making clean meat cheap, like breakthrough formulated, making clean energy cheap. It has also motivated some interesting forms of skepticism and criticism from the meat community, from the meat industry, from the environmental and foodie communities. And Jessica and I talk a little bit about that too. Jessica, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Breakthrough got interested in fake meat right around the same time that we got interested in food and agriculture issues explicitly. I I think it was in 2016 or 2017 that our whole staff went went to Coxcomb Restaurant, which is one of the first places that the Impossible Burger was available, and tried it. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it has fascinated me in a, in a really interesting way, far beyond what I, what I can even understand. Um, but, you know, fake meat, plant-based, cell-based, and we'll talk about, uh, you know, all the, all the different types of products that are coming onto the market today, um, is a very breakthrough VN kind of solution. Um, we're talking ab- about uh, serving the same demand in society, um, just cheaper and in many ways better. Um, it's, it's, you know, similar to a nuclear plant or a solar panel that's providing the same kind of energy, just cheaper and without the pollution or the effects on health or the effects on animal welfare um, when you start talking about fake meat. Um, and so I have just really enjoyed watching this space grow. Um, you know, you, uh, beyond uh, other companies, other products, um, the conversation around cell-based, and, and also uh, in the last year or two, started to see some of the conflicts bubble up, right? Um, so I, I wanted to talk about all that today. Um, but before we get into that, I was hoping you could tell us just how long you've been at Impossible and what your role is there. Sure. Um, I started at Impossible in 2016, um, right when we launched with uh, David Chang at Momofuku with our first um, product, the Impossible Burger. And um, my role is inclusive of uh, PR, events, our influence team, um, sustainability and impact, and partnerships. All of that is a significant part of Impossible Foods' mission, right? We're not just talking uh, about sneakily replacing cow-based meat at grocery stores and restaurants with a plant-based uh, alternative. We're talking uh, about, so, about sort of cultural awareness. We're talking about a big cultural and societal shift. That's right. That's right. We're, what we're talking about is uh, replacing the needs for animals in the food system. So that's a concept, and the business and the products are in service of that concept, and we're communicating that concept in a lot of different ways, and that's broadly what my my job is. So to get at how that concept is is be, is being actualized, I I have three questions that are related. Um, so why plants? Why cows? And why hamburgers? Uh, and if it makes sense, I just wanted to, to ask them all at once and see if, if you could could sort of uh, answer those three questions. You bet. Um, so why plants? Uh, I think that that sort of um, depends on uh, Pat Brown's, our founder's orientation in the world as a biochemist um, and as a vegan and as an environmentalist. Um, he understood that uh, as a vegan and as a scientist, that the plant, you know, life on the planet um, is vastly underused as food, that there there are lots of combinations of plants that we have not yet considered, um, and that you can take parts of plants and combine them in ways that they hadn't been combined before to um, 
to approximate, you know, textures that we're familiar with now. Um, he, he was aware of that. Um, I think uh, that's why he, uh, when he took a sabbatical from Stanford, he really thought about um, how to address climate change and biodiversity collapse and that um, it had to be replacing meat, but that uh, plants were an obvious way to do it um, if you did it in a different way, um, which led him to uh, some assumptions about what makes meat taste like meat and that that could be found in the plant kingdom. So that's why plants, um, cows are um, by far uh, the, the problem here when it comes to animal agriculture and, and our meat consumption. They, 40% um, of ice-free land in the U.S. is used to raise crops to feed cows or to um, raise cows directly. So they have taken over as the dominant species and that needs to change. So that's why cows. Um, why burgers? Because we, especially in the U.S., are obsessed with burgers. We love them. Everyone loves them. It's sort of a cultural um, phenomenon and has been for a very long time. Um, I think most people would say it's the, the meat product they crave the most. And we knew at the founding of Impossible Foods that we would have to work with people's fundamental, you know, likes and desires and cravings and give those same um, attributes and values that they're looking for in that meat product, but provide it a different way. And the burger just seemed like the perfect place to start. So that's why burger. And you mentioned something else that I hadn't actually fully considered when we were talking before the recording, um, the idea that you really also wanted to start in restaurants, uh, working with chefs and, and not just one chef, right? You have your you have your in-house chefs, right? Um, and obviously you, you work on the product at Impossible before it's sent out into the world, um, but you wanted the Impossible burger to be served at restaurants before it was available in uh, in grocery stores, if anything, right? Hundred um, percent. I think that was huge and key to our success. Um, so we launched with one amazing chef, David Chang, and he put us on the map both in a sort of influence way, but also um, because he served the product so exquisitely. Um, and we just built from there. So Coxcomb was in, in the second, um, um, batch of restaurants that we started to serve at in San Francisco and then in LA, um, all with top chefs, Chris Cosentino, Tal Ronan, Tracy Desjardins, um, that sort of sealed impossible as a culinary phenomenon. Um, those chefs each brought their magic and transformed the product. And really that highlighted what is very unique to Impossible, which is um, it is so meat-like um, that you can really use it to, you know, create anything you want. So it, it works perfectly in any dish that requires ground beef. Um, but going to restaurants first where the restaurateur's, you know, whole um, reputation, you know, is, is related to the food that they serve and the fact that they're serving Impossible, it was, um, you know, the consumer experience around that was so good that I think people really understood that this was something that was um, here to stay, having it in that way. So when, when you were describing where the idea for an impossible foods and an impossible hamburger came from, you, you, you mentioned something, you said um, that Pat Brown uh, thought that you might be able to combine plants to create certain textures that would resemble meat, which on the one hand sounds obviously, it sounds and is very innovative. On the other hand, when you think about it, that's just how most food is, some kind of combination of plants, right? Um, whether that sort of combination and processing is done uh, at the producer level or the consumer level or both. Um, and this is actually where uh, you and I sort of got acquainted first. So these is, is some of these um, questions around um, impossible foods uh, and, and sort of the, the whole category of fake meat. Um, uh, the, this, this category of skepticism around, oh, it's hyper-processed, oh, it's super technological, oh, we can't pronounce these ingredients, um, uh, which has frustrated me as a proponent of technological solutions to environmental problems. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, is that something um, that uh, that Impossible Food sort of foresaw? And, and how, have, how have you at Impossible thought about dealing with it? Yeah, um, 
I'd say when we launched, um, we knew and we still know today that the thing that would matter most was taste. We would never get anyone's attention around our environmental mission if it didn't taste good. It just right. wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. Um, so I think at the beginning, um, we knew that we would be dealing with a certain amount of, of fear of the new um, with with the product. I mean, that word Frankenfood, you know, was sort of bandied about, you know, in our in our training sessions around messaging. Um, and, you know, we were prepared for that question, I think, from journalists. Um, I think we we because the product was so good um, and that was so surprising to people, um, so much of the attention at the beginning was just on uh, how delicious it was. And um, we didn't get as much of that pushback as we had anticipated we would. Um, you know, we we didn't, you know, dive headstrong into talking about uh, the science at the beginning. Um, we 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 had ambitions to be very transparent. We always have, and we will always will be. But um, I think we fundamentally knew that um, that there's a certain amount of tasting is believing here. That that um, once that happens, uh, you earn the right to have a deeper conversation about the science and technology around the product. And I mean, that's where I think now, um, a few years later, we are um, seeing all of that kind of suspicion around the new um, really flare up. And I think it's because we've had a certain amount of success in the market. Um, so, you know, maybe we've just, you know, earned um, the suspicion that now, you know, we're, we're getting um, a little bit more overtly um, from different groups. But you're, as of the last year or so, uh, you're also available in, for instance, Burger King, um, which is a different, I assume, type of marketing and strategy than uh, Coxcomb or even sort of like fast casual places like Gots at the Ferry Building in San Francisco or like the thousands or whatever of other independent restaurants that you partnered with on, you know, before you, you scaled up to sort of national, nationally recognized chains. So how ha what was, the, was um, the partnership with Burger King and maybe some other national change as much as an inflection point as it looks like from the outside? It was huge. I mean, it was it was huge, huge, but it was a, it was a combination of things. We launched um, the Impossible Burger 2.0. Um, last January at CES. Um, and so a food company at a technology, consumer technology show was sort of a, a what, you know, to, to people. They really wondered about that. And the fact that we were launching the next version, the update, you know, of our product there, um, I think got people really excited and interested and wanting to try it. And it was categorically better. So 2.0 versus 1.0, um, just like hands down better. So we replaced the wheat protein with soy protein, made it grillable. Um, so it was just a better product. So a lot of excitement around that. Plus right on the heels of that, we launched with Burger King, which just put, um, you know, a huge stamp of accessibility and um, familiarity, you know, on the product and, and literally made it accessible. Um, nationwide. So that was, that was giant for the company. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you know, um, my, I have sort of my own reflections on how the sort of foodie and environmental community reacted to that. You know, you know, you know, what I pointed out in my essay on this last year was that was exactly what you said that when impossible and, and other plant-based products launched, not even sort of publicly, um, but when they were first being rolled out, um, you had a bunch of sort of foodie influencers like Mark Bittman who were singing their praises. Um, and then as soon as it's more widely available and as soon as it's available at places like Burger King, um, these sort of, you know, less high end places, you start to see more skepticism um, in, in a way uh, that I found pretty gross. Um, uh, so uh, sort of what was the reaction uh, within the company to that? And, and how do you how do you think about um, you know, sort of obviously taking the concerns around um, around sort of brand halo and, and sort of environment, the culture of environmentalism seriously, um, but continuing to, I assume, have a really aggressive strategy for, for pushing this product out on the market. Yeah, I mean, and first of all, for anyone who has not read Alex's piece, um, I think read it right now. It it made everyone at Impossible stand up and cheer because um, you revealed so much of what was going on with uh, the kind of 
culinary um, suspicion, you know, of uh, just fast food, you know, and, and um, questioning all of a sudden questioning the, uh, the environmental story behind impossible or the ingredients behind impossible because we were making it available at fast food. Um, that is, you know, classism and racism and all wrapped up into kind of our, our biases around, you know, around food. So we, um, we weren't, we, I don't think we were totally prepared for that, that backlash from, um, you know, some of the members of like the food, you know, thought community. Um, but it didn't affect our strategy. I mean, our strategy has stayed the same, which is, uh, focus on making the best product, making it available everywhere where meat is sold. Um, we started with the high end, uh, you know, particularly because we believe chefs are the most amazing influencers. Um, and, you know, but our intention was always to be everywhere as soon as possible. And I think that really shows that this is meat. I mean, it's meat like 80, 20 ground beef. Um, you see in all sorts of presentations, you know, across the board from high end culinary to, um, fast food. So that was, that was our, our, our strategy was consistent, but, the response was interesting. <laughs> uh, very interesting. And, you know, to my mind, it really revealed a sh at least a shortcoming in a lot of sort of conventional environmental narratives around more sustainable food systems. Uh, what compels me about the Impossible Burger is that, yeah, when I ate it four years ago or whatever at Coxcomb, I could feel better about my privileged ability to go to Coxcomb and order a lower impact hamburger. Um, but that doesn't mean anything if it can't scale globally. And that means scaling to fast food restaurants, to grocery stores. And it's just uh, a bummer when that happens. And that, that, that very act is incompatible with, um, with sort of the, inv the sort of environmental instinct around what is sustainable. It, it, um, it makes you think that uh, having a, a solution that is scaled to the problem is actually not compatible with a lot of the ways we think about food and environment today. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It was, uh, incredibly, um, short-sighted, I think on, on the part of the critics there, because I mean, when you look at it, I mean, Burger King has come out and, and, and said very publicly that this has been very successful for their company. And we have introduced via Burger King, you know, many, many people to the idea of a plant-based burger being just as delicious as the Impossible Whopper, you know, as the traditional Whopper. And now they are open to this journey around plant-based meat um, that, you know, has no cholesterol and no antibiotics and is much friendlier to the environment if you care about that, you know, but the benefits of the product alone um, required a, a Burger King to to introduce them to you know all sorts of people that just didn't have a coxcomb in the backyard. Um, so it was it was it's all been a very interesting evolution this last year. Yeah, uh, you know one of the one of the other things that struck me is how similar the various criticisms of plant based and alternative meat um, have been from constituencies that normally wouldn't align themselves with each other. So at, at the same time, you have a bunch of sort of well-to-do foodie environmentalists uh, ask, you know, sort of asking pointed questions uh, around sort of how do you spell this ingredient and you have, have you ever heard of this before? And you hear the same criticisms from, you know, the beef industry. Um, uh, again, two coalitions that uh, are, are opposed are finding the, the sort of the same rationale uh, to themselves oppose this, this new disruptive product. And it it just puzzles me that that uh, that that cognitive dissonance doesn't occur to them. That's right. And I mean, I, this is where I think what the breakthrough um, team does so well is just point out that um, there really is a uh, split between those that really want progress and those that really do are inclined to look backwards as the way forward. And I think in in food you know, food system thinking, um, we have found a, a lot of similarity between our, our critics, you know, are generally folks that think that there is a path forward in returning to a better time that, that was long ago. And, um, and we at Impossible Foods just don't see that as the way forward. I mean, we really think you do need to just 
find a new way to uh, scratch the same itch. Um, but going backwards um, is not a possibility. So again, this I don't think this makes uh, Impossible Foods sort of categorically different from a lot of other food producers. Again, we're at, at some level we're talking uh, about you know, producing uh, and uh, and processing raw ingredients uh, to send them to suppliers to be finally transformed by chefs or by home cooks or whatever. Um, it's so it's it's not categorically different, but I, I wanted it, it strikes me that um, Impossible Foods, you know, when I listen to you talk about it, when I listen to Pat Brown talk about it, has a couple different sort of I don't know if, I don't know if you want to call it marketing advantages or marketing strategies, but one is. Um, one is the the sort of the new science. You're you're actually combining plant byproducts and plants in ways that have never been combined before, and there and there's some really exciting just new science happening um, at uh, at the company. Um, but then also you're you are working with chefs. You are thinking about the consumer and thinking about how Impossible Foods products can be used in the home. Um, so you could talk a little bit about um, sort of those two different strategies, you know, sort of like the sort of highly um, scientific and technological and innovative side of things and the, I guess, foodier <laughs> side of things. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, we have an amazing R&D team. Um, they're, they're doubling right now in size. And so they're really focused on, uh, it's pretty exciting, not just recreating all of the um, most environmentally impacting um, meats that we enjoy today, but also even like letting themselves imagine what we might crave and want tomorrow that we haven't even consumed yet. Um, so that all is really exciting work that's going on in R&D. But when it comes to uh, actually what we serve in restaurants and what ends up on the retail you know, shelves, it's going to be very culinary dictated, culinarily dictated. So um, we have, you know, we have chefs on staff. We have a, a series of advisors that we sort of work with and understand what works, what doesn't. Um, but really when the product gets out into the market and we see what chefs are doing with it, that's when we start to really understand um, the creativity at play here and and how that is captivating people. I think this year is exciting because we're finally going to be widely available at retail. So um, we decided when we launched, we were going to lean on um, who we think is the most influential, you know, to the home chef. And that we decided was your grandma. So we leaned into a marketing strategy around grandmas and we had Chrissy Ty's amazing, um, Chrissy Teigen's amazing mom, Pepper Ty, come out at our launch and cook with the impossible and cook her recipes that she grew up making for her family with the impossible. That I think um, is what makes this uh, very ownable and familiar to people is when you're making the things you have always made, but you're just replacing it with impossible. Um, then everyone's, you know, a chef, an impossible chef. You are just in the process of launching impossible pork right now. Uh, so, so why pork and what do you, what do you think is important about uh, displacing or replacing animal-based pork products? Yeah, so um, pork is high up there in terms of impact. Um, uh, pigs occupy, you know, a lot of room. They require a lot of resources. Um, I think that the impossible pork um, as a follow-up to the beef product is really important for the Asian market that we're um, focused on. So uh, animal ag um, and meat consumption is, uh, you know, increasing in China more than any place on the planet. And we see that coming and we want to address it. We know that pork is the most consumed meat in Asia. Um, so finding a replacement for pork as soon as we could was always part of the strategy. Um, so we are immediately launching with Burger King as a as a breakfast sandwich, but we'll follow that up with um, with a pork product on the market, hopefully soon, and soon enough, hope to take it to China. Yeah, if, if I recall correctly, obviously, as you said at the beginning of the episode, cattle, uh, you know, beef cows and dairy cows are the are by far the biggest sort of single environmental influence uh, from agriculture broadly from animal agriculture certainly um but globally pork and chicken are consumed more from a sort of a weight and calorie basis um so those have to be sort of top of mind for companies looking to displace animal agriculture yep that's right i mean um 
you know, for a while we were strategically only focused on the cow because we thought if we focus there, we would have the most impact. But when you look at it in a global context, um, you start to make different decisions and prioritize, you know, other meats over, um, over, you know, some meats over others. And pork was that, that exactly. I think once we opened um, operations in in Hong Kong and Singapore, we started to really understand that that needed to be our strategic focus. Like Asia is top of the list. So um, pork jumped the list and, and now it's our second product. So talking to you, my sense is that if there is a meat product in the world today, there's somebody at Impossible Foods thinking about how to replace it. Um, uh, I, I wonder if you could uh, talk as much as you're able to at this stage um, about what sorts of other products Impossible is interested in in the near, medium, or long term. Yeah, I mean, everything that comes from an animal, we're sort of interested in making. Um, definitely, uh, the more um, it impacts the environment, um, biodiversity collapse and climate change, the more um, we will prioritize it. Um, but that said, what's interesting about the R&D team is one discovery um, on one product will lead to um, knowledge that could be applied in um, a totally different way to another product. And so uh, as this knowledge base, you know, ac accumulates, um, it's it's going to be interesting to see what ends up coming f first and, and what we save for later. But um, all, all of the products from animals, including milk, cheese, um, fish, all of it is on the table right now for Impossible Foods to produce. It's an audacious mission, to be sure, uh, replacing all animal agriculture by 2035. And I appreciate that your mission has a deadline, which I feel like most organizations, companies' missions don't. Um, how are you all feeling about your mission several years into sort of widespread consumer uh, knowledge and, and sort of you know, actual success so far? I mean, if you would have told me in 2016 that we would be here um, in 2020 having uh, plant-based meat available um, you know, in in every city in the country, um, at high end and fast food restaurants, in the grocery stores, private labeled and with this many brands, um, you know, working on it, I, I would have not believed you. I mean, it, so Impossible Foods needs to double every year if we're going to have the impact that that we need to have. That's that's crazy. I mean, just we we've we've met that mark so far in our history as a company, but. Um, that level of of sustained growth is is hard to to wrap your head around. Um, but I think that for better or for worse, all of the climate reporting that has happened over the last year, all of the you know kids taking to the streets, you know, and and rallying for change, all of that is working towards bringing more awareness um, to our situation and and. Impossible Foods is one of the rare um, companies that have an actual solution that consumers can adopt and apply um, day to day and have a direct effect. Um, so, you know, I think that is working in our favor, um, but it, it, it is it is a pretty, um, <laughs> pretty uh huge idea that we would actually replace all animals in the food system by 2035. And the fact that Pat Brown um, didn't really have any science behind that date, it was more, we need to put, a, you know, we need to put our foot down around a date, choose one and go with it. And, and now our entire company is oriented around it um, and have plans to make sure it happens. Uh, I mean, it's pretty exciting. It, it lends, you know, creates quite an interesting atmosphere at Impossible. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, and it is a really sort of ex exciting and interesting just sort of product category. Um, the way that I, the reason, the, the, the main reason that I think that I have been so into not just consuming fake meat, um, but conversations around plant-based meat and, and meat alternatives um, is that it seems like one of the only, one of the few forms of conspicuous consumption that can have sort of a positive environmental impact. There are laudable reasons to not fly on airplanes or not to uh, use plastic straws um, or to not drive a car or things like that. There's relatively few things that you can do in your sort of personal visible consumption that sort of both have an impact and signal with the type of impact that you want to have. You know, you can put solar panels on your rooftop, but that's still 
uh, requires you to have a house and be able to afford it and is not as visible. Um, you can obviously march um, like uh, you know, all of the activists that, that you just referenced, um, you know, consuming plant-based meat um, or, or, or protein alternatives are, is by no means the only way to signal that you are an environmentalist in your sort of daily life, your political life, your consumption life. But it is unique in, in a way that I, I have a hard time thinking of uh, a, a lot of, uh, of other um, sort of sim similarly promising forms of consumption. Totally. And, and I think that's why, um, to a certain extent, veganism as a concept didn't work because that was sort of about not consuming something, right. denial, taking something away, rather than working with our um, blatant need to, um, you know, show off our values. And I think you're right. I mean, the impossible burger has become a symbol for, for people around, um, around that. And, you know, I think um, it'll be interesting as we move into retail and people are actually cooking in this at home instead of, you know, carrying a, you know, impossible Whopper wrapper, um, how that, how that shifts or evolves. But, um, but it's, it's, I mean, it's all back to kind of the, you know, base thinking around impossible is that we have to work with capitalism and, and, you know, use the market to our advantage. And, um, and I think you're right. I think people sort of have, um, adopted impossible as one of those symbols that they're uh, sustainable or sustainably minded. Jessica, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. That was fun. Thanks for tuning in to Breakthrough Dialogues. If you like our show, tell your friends, rate us, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or whatever platform you get your podcasts on. I want to again thank my guest Jessica and our producers Alyssa Kadaman and Tali Perlman. Catch you next time.